creating the machine instructions for an individual process, as we know, is a major step in process planning. We are going to look at machine instructions in the context of what we call computer numerical control, where we are trying to control the operation of some equipment in order to achieve the desired outcome, which is related to the design specification. So when we think about controlling the operation <clears throat> of a machine tool using CNC, uh, the first thing that you should focus on is the design specification. And the reason for that is that we need to create some process geometry. And that process geometry will be derived based upon what you're seeing in the design specification. We'll also have to select the appropriate tooling that is necessary uh, to produce the effect that that machine tool will have on the surface of the material. And a critical step in NC is coming up with the toolpath, which is essentially the geometry in which the tool will move. And of course, then we have some parameters that need to be set for a specific machine tool, and that will depend upon the characteristics of that machine tool. If we look at tooling information as it relates to our CNC, uh, we think of the tool type, and the perspective there is on the geometry of the tool. So is the tool represented as a point, a spherical surface, or a flat surface, or some other type of geometry? This will have an impact upon the surface that we're trying to create, or the feature, based upon the design specification. The tool will also have fixed dimensions, which will relate to the resultant geometry that we produce after going through this process. During the process, the tool will have some type of status information. The primary one would be its location in some coordinate system. So here we're talking about an XYZ point in space, and perhaps whether or not it's rotating in that space at that time, or it's in the process of moving to a new location, in other words, a new point, and whether it's making contact with the material in terms of removing material, or it is not making contact, so we consider that non-cutting. Now, when you think about your process, in your operations process chart, we had an O-1, and we indicated here that this was value adding. So the first thing we see in the actual operation itself, if I have non-cutting uh, episodes during this CNC program that we're going to write, then that indicates that we have less than 100% value adding occurring in this process. And that will be true of almost every operation that we perform. There will be some percent of the time in which we have non-cutting or non-value adding tasks that are current. And then of course we're concerned about our tool speed because that will affect, as you know from 248, your tool life and also what the surface looks like after we perform that cutting operation. Well, we need to know something about machine geometry. And this gets very specific to the equipment that you are going to use, whether it's existing equipment or you, go, you are going to purchase equipment. When we think of the motion of the tool, we're going to look at that as a translation along an axis. In other words, a coordinate system axis. And then there's also the possibility of rotation about an axis. Well, the question you should ask is, how many axes do you have for a particular piece of equipment? And that will determine the complexity of your program. Now, most configurations, what you'll see is this rotating spindle will correspond to the z-axis in the machine's coordinate system. And there will be some finite work envelope, in other words, some geometric volume in which our workpiece will have to be contained. Now, it may not be the entire workpiece, uh, 
but the part that we are going to modify has to fit within this work envelope. And that is determined by the constraints on the machine travel, and so it's directly tied to the specific piece of equipment that we're using. Now, examples of uh, machine configurations would be a vertical mill, a horizontal mill, and most of what you have probably done in 248 uses the vertical mill configuration. And then we have turning. Now, obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other configurations as well. So here's an example uh, that you should be familiar with, the Haas machine uh, that you did some simple CNC, uh, ran some CNC programs on. We have the spindle, and the spindle is rotating about this axis. So we have this vertical mill. And again, our z-axis here is aligned with that. So z is plus going up, minus going down. And we look at the types of motions that are supported. We have three translations and no rotations. Now, of course, you can look at the spindle and say, well, we have rotation about the z-axis. That's true with the cutting tool. But in terms of uh, machine travel, we will not be able to rotate the tool with respect to the workpiece. And contained in this region here is the work envelope. So that's a very real constraint on what you can do with this piece of equipment. On the panel here you should recognize the controller. So we'll download our program to the controller, do some setup, some initial parameters, and then we'll run our program and it will control the path of this tool as it produces the geometry that we're trying to achieve. So this is a pretty standard configuration, the three-axis vertical mill. If we go to the horizontal configuration, the principle is still the same. We have three axes. We're going to provide three translations. And now you can see here we have a fairly open work envelope. Now when you see these coordinate systems, Hopefully, what that brings to your mind in terms of the workpiece is the concept of a datum and a datum reference frame. Because we're going to have to reconcile that from the design specification. What does that mean in the context of our work envelope and the machine configuration? Of course, Z, again, is still configured to be the uh, axis of the spindle. So you can see the reason why it's a horizontal configuration. We've rotated the spindle by 90 degrees. And now we can machine a surface that's oriented with respect to that spindle. Also note the tool library here, which uh, we did not see in the previous configuration. And this is quite common. These libraries can be quite extensive, uh, running up to hundreds of tools. This is a fairly constrained library here. And the reason for this tool library is so that we can have the flexibility of <clears throat> processing many different types of parts with the same machine configuration, but we'll be using different tools that will be automatically loaded into the spindle. Here we have a very simple turning configuration where <clears throat> we have two types of motions, again, translations. Here's our axis of symmetry about which we're going to rotate. The difference here is that the workpiece is actually rotating and not the tool. But the principle is still the same whether the workpiece is moving or the tool is moving. We provide some translation along the z-axis, along uh, the spindle, so I can move my tool to the left or to the right as I create features. And, of course, you should recognize that the features we're creating are axial in terms of symmetry about the axis that the workpiece is rotating. And then our second uh, capability here would be to move normal to the Z and move in and out in terms of depth of cut of the bar stock that's rotating in the spindle. When you think about the tool and or the workpiece moving in that work envelope, we have to somehow control the motion of the tool 
or the workpiece. One type of control is just a simple point to point and will treat each axis x, y, and z as independent of each other. So there's no connection. And now if I have to move from the red point here to the green point here, and I'm just looking at two dimensions for right now for simplicity, uh, we have a certain velocity in x and a certain velocity in y. And then of course we have a certain distance in x and distance in y. Now if we set these velocities equal, but the uh, distance in y is shorter than the distance in x, then obviously what's going to happen here if we move independent, I will not have a straight line, but I will reach the y location before I reach the x location. And that's because the distances are not equal. So the type of motion we get here is a point to point along the axis, and now I do not get a straight line versus a contoured approach. And here what we're going to do is coordinate the axis motion. So it's no longer independent. And now we'll be moving from this red point to the green point along a straight line. In order to achieve that straight line, given the x and y distances being the same as what we saw here, then we know that we'll have to adjust the velocity of the y along the y-axis and it will be less than the velocity along the x-axis. But the velocity along the line will be constant, of course, with some deviation. So when you begin to think about writing the machine instructions, again, in the context of C and C, we should think about the geometry of the initial workpiece. So what state is our part in at this point. Now it could be that we initially start with some stock material which essentially has no real geometry to it, very basic uh, such as bar stock or a rectangular prism or you could be dealing with a uh, the result of some type of casting operation which requires some finishing in terms of machining. And so the state of that ore could be uh, something that was processed in a previous operation and now we're just adding features to it. So it could be another CNC uh, part program running on a different machine configuration. So when we think of the state, we have to know what the geometry is of the workpiece when it enters this operation. Because of course, that's going to affect what we're going to do in terms of controlling the tooling. And then we have to know something about the geometry of the tool itself. What effect does that tooling geometry have on the surface? So when it makes contact with the surface, what will the outcome be? Will it be a uh, flat surface that we're machining? Will it be a cylindrical surface, such as in a boring operation? And then what is the final geometry you are trying to achieve in this operation? It may not be the uh, final geometry that matches the design specification, but what specifically are we trying to achieve here? Typically, what you are trying to produce is one or more features that relate to the design specification. So we're going to move the tool to create the surface that achieves the geometric uh, attributes of the features on that design spec. And of course, as in any process, we're always interested in how many set setups do I have to perform in order to complete this operation. And we're concerned about setups because this will relate to our cycle time, which, of course, impacts our manufacturing lead time. Note that as we increase the number of setups, the percent of our cycle time where we are adding value will uh, significantly decrease. So you'd like to minimize that number of setups, but that will depend upon the machine configuration and the geometry that we are trying to achieve. If you look at an NC part program, the you have to know something about the history. Where did it come from? So if you go back and look, 
you'll find this standard RS-274. And the history of NC can be traced back to the 1950s based upon some work done with the Air Force at MIT. And so you have to know something about computing at that time uh, and its capabilities. These initial machine tools that were created were actually driven by uh, paper tape. And so at that time, we had continuous rolls, and there's still some in existence today, of paper tape. And then going across the paper tape, we would punch holes, say eight holes, and that would actually represent information related to the NC part program. Specifically, it represent, represented a byte of information. So if you think back to your uh, IE-148 days, you know that in a byte you have eight bits. And so we could have eight holes going across here, up to eight holes. And a hole could indicate a one, and not having a hole could indicate a zero. So whatever the configuration was, we could encode a set of bytes. Now, why is this important to know this? Well, essentially nothing has changed since those days. So when this machine was operated, we read the tape, and the tape was processed, again, by uh, rolling the tape from one spool to another, and sequentially reading all the byte information as the tape passed under uh, what was air passing through the holes and then being detected by a sensor above the tape. So what we end up with is a sequence of these bytes. Well, of course, this technology has uh, been retired, and we've gotten a lot more sophisticated in terms of what we can do uh, with reading data, sharing data across the network, and so forth. But the principle remains the same, so that what we end up with today is a text file instead of a piece of paper tape. And that text file is essentially the set of bytes that are read sequentially, and that's the key here, sequential execution, line by line, and character by character. So it, it's fairly straightforward in terms of control flow, uh, not like when you were writing Visual Basic programs. The other thing that you don't want to use in that text file in which you're going to create your program is tabs. And really, the uh, when we run this controller, we really don't care about spaces as well. So we're only looking for bytes of information sequentially, and that computer code that we read is going to tell us something about how the machine tool should be controlled. So it's a very basic uh, way to program a uh, machine tool because it's all sequential. And then the geometry is going to be created by the toolpath that we define by these individual bytes of information in the NC code. This will be the largest percentage of your code because that's really where you're doing the work. But then we'll have some special commands where we'll have to set tool parameters uh, in order to get the type of performance that we want out of our machine tool. Well, where do we start? The uh, first thing that you're going to specify is the line number. And really, this goes back to uh, when NC was developed. So in many programming languages at that time, the line number had to be specified. And this is indicated by using an encode. The encode indicating that uh, we have a line number specification. And then we'll have no more than five digits that follow that encode. Also note that your line number should be numbered sequentially. And you want to leave spaces in between there because when you come back, you might want to insert some additional toolpath specification. So it's not a bad approach to uh, skip, say, five or six numbers as long as it's increasing in uh, value. So when I say numbered sequentially, uh, what I'm saying here is that that number has to increase from the top to the bottom. 
What's going to follow this line number is uh, a set of codes, again, individual bytes that will be read sequentially. The control number is based upon what we call the G-code. Now, G-code is often used as a way to refer to NC code. When you see that term that someone is writing G-code, essentially they're using that RS-274 standard, but G-code is only a part of all the codes that we're going to use. Of course, it accounts for the majority of the codes that you see in a typical part program. The G code is going to specify some type of control action. And it's fairly generic because, as you'll see, there are a variety of ways in which we'll control our machine tool. We'll use two digits following the G code to have a unique uh, correspondence to the type of control we want to perform. A lot of what you'll see in the G code has to do with motion control. And by motion control, what we're saying is we're going to somehow control the toolpath. Then we're going to have a capability of selecting coordinate systems because, as we know, if we have some type of geometry, we need to know the coordinate system in which that geometry has some meaning. We'll also have the capability of somehow compensating for tool geometry, and you'll see later that that's fairly important in order to achieve your final surface. Of course, units are important, whether we're using inches or millimeters. And so that seems fairly obvious, but you'd be surprised how many times that mistake is made by choosing the wrong units or not specifying the units explicitly and then relying upon the machine default, which may not be uh, what is called for in the design specification. Well, in motion control, it's going to be fairly simple we're going to have four G codes that uh, will account for the majority of all motion. The G00 note is the fast move, which means you should not be cutting uh, because you'll break a tool if you come in contact with the surface. G01 is quite common because that provides linear travel. And then our G02 will give us a clockwise arc in a plane and G03 will be the opposite direction, counterclockwise. We need both, depending on what we're trying to achieve on the surface. So I've got a straight move, again, a contour. I've got a, a clockwise arc. And then I've got a counterclockwise arc. So what this is saying is, in order to achieve your final geometry, you're going to have to break down your process geometry into one of these types of moves. Again, the G00 would be for non-cutting. <clears throat> so when I look at my geometry in the design spec, I need to start thinking about how am I going to achieve that final uh, feature geometry based upon these uh, specific uh, tool motions. So if I have a parabolic surface, question is, how can you achieve that type of geometry when all you have is an arc, uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise, or a straight line? So next time we'll take a look at uh, how we might use these G-codes in our path planning.